So um, our speaker this evening hardly needs any introduction to us. Uh, he's very well known to most of us. Um, he did his doctorate in medieval archaeology here at Queen's and a senior lecture in that subject here for quite a wee while, I think you might say. 38 and two thirds years, according well, to the, say, the, the pension fund. <laughs> we, we really couldn't hope for anybody more qualified to talk to us in medieval archaeology. Very grateful for him to coming along to talk to us. Author of many articles and books. Um, Sure, some of you have got some of his books on your bookshelves. Um, I certainly have, and uh, no doubt be more, more forthcoming. So, um, he's also very well known to us as um, a very entertaining and informative uh, tour guide, as uh, he's taken us um, over the years in very many, uh, very many uh, field excursions, uh, most recently to uh, Greencastle and Carlingford this summer which was greatly enjoyed by us all. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Tom and say thanks very much indeed for, for coming, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, well, on a, to start on a personal note, uh, I realised when I was, uh, this was fixed up, that uh, it is in fact uh, an important anniversary of mine because in September, 17, 1973, uh, 50 years ago, I handed in my dissertation um, to a chorus of crows at the background. So uh, the obvious, your obvious reaction to this is either one of two things, either um, obviously that this is the distilled wisdom of 50 years of high grade academic research, or for God's sake, you'd have thought the guy would have learnt by now. Uh, or indeed that this is the meanderings of a guy long past his sell-by date. Anyway, uh, it is a curious introduction and a curious uh, coincidence. I have been obviously on and off thinking about this sort of thing for a long time. Um, and this gives me a chance to try and put some of my ideas together and share them. Uh, what I want to talk about is quite carefully uh, chosen, uh, both the date and the area. The date in particular, I want to start uh, not conventionally, uh, but in 1100. Uh, there were two major upheavals in the 12th century in Ireland. Uh, one was the reform of the church, and the other was the coming of the English lords in after 1169 and normally that's the one that you would I would be expected to start with would be 1177 John de Courcy arrives in uh, County Down and everything changes this has always been the conventional uh, organization and story that it the coming of the English by whatever means, uh, caused an enormous amount of change. Uh, and in this, the reform of the church uh, earlier in the 12th century has got rather left out of the narrative. Not, I think, deliberately, and people have particularly recently have been working on it, but it has got semi-detached, I think, from a lot of society. It has been treated as an event for the church alone, not something which affected much of society. And it has also been led very much by historians who are themselves led very much by the documents. So it has been concerned very largely with the major institutions of the church, monasteries, the diocese, uh, not the church very much on the ground as it would have affected other people or most people. Uh, so, but on the other hand, I think, as you will see, that this has neglected a serious uh, amount of change. Uh, there is economic change at the same time, a lot of social change. And uh, we have got in front of us, uh, in the, uh, theoretically, you can think of uh, several reactions to this. And I, was, I would like to 
see it in the terms of whether we're looking at a major upheaval brought in from outside, development internally, or somewhere in between the two with uh, new structures not necessarily being imposed or working against the grain, but working with the society as it was. So that's why I'm starting in 1100. I start, stop at 1300 because, uh, or very shortly afterwards, because I don't want to get involved, but either with the uh, story or the picture that it gives of, of the 14th century, which is one very much of decay and, and crisis. Uh, I want to see the th how the changes worked out while things were going well. The area would be uh, basically, uh, you all know where County Antrim is, but, uh, sorry, um, it, 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 I won't be doing the whole of County Antrim. I'll ignore this part down here. Uh, uh, the uh, dean of the area of Dalboyne, because very, we know, frankly, very little about it. Um, so it's from a line about there of County Antrim. Uh, you can see it's very mixed uh, farming. You've got the highlands, the, the uplands here, which are poor farm, then uh, belts of good land, uh, are uh, alternating and mixed in between. So it's a very varied landscape, uh, a lot of roots through it and connecting it to uh, elsewhere. Um, right, to start with the, about the church reform as such, because it's a thing that is less, as I say, less noticed. Its origins lie well outside and lie in the, uh, tensions are really of Germany and Italy, uh, which inspired a, a major managerial reform of the Western church, which took place in the, from the late 11th century onwards in a series of, of synods and, and edicts. The aim was to produce a, one of the clear, uh, important aims was to produce a clear cut managerial structure uh, in the case of the secular church, this would be the papacy, archbishops, bishops, parishes, uh, each one responding up and down the chain. In the case of the uh, orders, they would no longer be individual monasteries, but uh, or the monasteries would no longer be individual, but gathered together into orders. Uh, who would have uh, either chapters or directors, again, responsible to the papacy or to the Pope. Uh, this was brought over to Ireland at the right at the beginning of the 12th century uh, in a movement start, which uh, formally starts with the uh, Synod of uh, Rath Bressel in 1111. This set up for the first time territorial bishoprics uh, across Ireland, modeled very largely on uh, the kingdoms, which ended up giving Ireland far too many bishops, far more than they could, uh, the country could afford. Uh, indeed, from certain point of view, um, any bishop is more than we can afford. Anyway, um, this, uh, has been, as I say, discussed largely in terms of the top. What interests me is what we see here, the introduction of the parish, much more than the diocese. The parish, there was nothing like it before, as far as we can see pastoral care in the earlier medieval church was largely organized in a system of uh, mother churches and dependent chapels or preaching places. In England, we find the same, the Minster and uh, the uh, burial church uh, in areas. But this swept that away, replacing them with a territorial system in which one priest was responsible for one particular area. And this area had to be closely defined because it was the, uh, uh, along with this was that the 
parish priest would be supported by tithes, a tenth of the produce of, the area, of his parish. Now, clearly, that requires definition, who is paying to which parish. And it's also very difficult to change, because if you move a field even from one parish to another, you are depriving the first uh, priest of some of his income and crediting it to another. Uh, and this, the first one will resist. This was, I think, something very new to the Irish landscape. The idea that you will have defined, literally defined boundaries, field by field. They also, because it is a tax, somebody will have to be responsible for paying it, either a community or a lord who is in charge uh, of that, the, the land that is due to be paid. Uh, and this will give you uh, what one might call uh, territorial units of production. If you wanted to be a bureaucrat, uh, we would call it, I think, more simply an estate. And estates will now be fixed as for ownership and as for boundaries uh, once this system is put in place. The, if you read the historiography, the, the histories of it, it is very often uh, normally assumed that the parish system was not introduced at the same time as the diocese. And that is reason you need the bishop there first and then to set it up. And this would be the responsibility of the bishop to do. But the delay that is thought is very long because people tend to roll up this uh, change, the change of introduction of parishes with the Anglo-Norman seizure of power. But in fact, there's a nearly a 50 year gap between the two events, the setting up of diocese and the arrival of the English. And it seems that a long time for bishops to get their act together to put parishes. But more to the point, particularly in Antrim, I think you can see evidence that uh, this was happening by the 1120s or 30s. The key man here is Malachi, St. Malachi as he became, who is Bishop of Connor and Down uh, from uh, 1124 uh, through to uh, his death in 1142. Uh, he is good nearly uh, some 20 odd years. Uh, of uh, being bishop. And he was a keen reformer, so, uh, and a keen supporter of the Augustinian canons. Uh, the earlier form of monastery, new monastery coming to Ireland before the more famous Cistercians uh, and uh, Savignon, the Order of Savigny. They're important for two reasons. First of all, that they took over many of the old monasteries, monastic sites, and uh, applied a, a rule to them and or brought them into an order, which was very flexible, which allowed for local variations, which suited uh, the traditional Irish practice. They were also, uh, across Europe, very uh, well known for being closely involved with parish formation, because they were uh, one of their principal forms of income was to be given the rights of the tithe uh, from parishes in order and the responsibility for appointing and regulating the priest. They were the rectors as opposed to the vicars of the parishes quite often. And here in this map, uh, you see uh, the parishes that were given to two of, particularly two of the uh, houses of Augustinian canons in the Diocese of Connor. One is Kells, one is Muckamore. Kells is traditionally associated with Malachi. Uh, he was said to have founded it, and he was also linked to Macamore, we have no date 
for the foundation of either. They're almost certainly in existence before de Courcy arrives. And you can see that they, particularly in care, that there is a sort of almost a deal. You can see that Muckamore, which is here, is taking uh, up ties, rectories from uh, the extreme south of the diocese. The, uh, this part here, they were going to Kells. Between the two of them, these form the core of the Diocese of Connor, the uh, area of the Kingdom of Dalnarija. Uh, now, those are being uh, given to monasteries founded uh, by priories founded almost certainly by Malachi and belonging to the time of Malachi. So I think it's almost certain to my mind that these, this was happening uh, on or before the time, or, uh, on or shortly after the time of Malachi himself. Uh, i.e. in the 12, uh, 1130s, 1140s, well before uh, the uh, arrival of de Courcy in 1177. Now that carries with it baggage, as I say, because the parish, the tithes and estates must all be tied in together. How did they decide where, where a parish should be or how big it should be, where its boundaries would be. They would take the normal, uh, to take the uh, areas controlled by individuals or groups, just as the diocese were built around kingdoms. So these would be built around lesser lords or other communities. And linked again to this is this is the time that we see the townland emerging. We first hear of the townland is in the 12th century. And the townland, a defined area of uh, land, would be uh, an ideal unit uh, to make as the building blocks for your parishes or else to divide the tithes of the parishes up. So I think parish, estate, and townland all go together and all go, went together by about 1150 in at least this part here. And you can see here the pattern of the parishes, a lot of small parishes uh, with uh, reasonably high values, contrasting as we will see with that there. Secular, uh, Lordship, I don't want to talk about politics or political things, but I'll just point out that the area I'm concerned with uh, is divided into a number of major lordships. The, obviously, the chief one is the earldom, uh, as it became of Ulster. And, uh, John de Courcy was never formally earl, but his successor, Hugh de Lacey, was. And that includes the counties, as it was referred to, of Antrim and Carrickfergus. John de Courcy's lordship ended about there, probably ended actually about here, uh, with these two lordships. To the north lay the kingdom of Ehertra, Irish Ehertra, uh, and Fierley. Uh, the boundary between Dalnarija and that are completely unknown, but it's, it may be up here. It may be down here. Uh, in the uh, around 1200, this part here, King John started mucking about with it and granting it to the land to the uh, to Galloway or uh, Macustrid families of Galloway. Um, they, uh, when De, uh, De Lacy returned in 1226, he ejected them. He sees this part here, the, the, the good land of the Northwest uh, for himself under the name of the County of Twescard and granted the glens and uh, to the family of Bissets, also from Galloway, uh, who, however, were enemies of the Macuchtrids. Uh, this left the center under the small Irish kingdom of Ehertra, 
both the Bissets and the Hertu were formerly tenants, held their land of the Earl. But clearly, uh, there is a difference between being directly under the Earl and being under an Irish king who is uh, answerable to the Earl. So there is no uniformity in the political organization of County Antrim, although there is a uniform overlord with the Earl. I want the, that's the last of the political history. Now to the uh, issues that were involved. The first is economic, the economic patterns that we can see. Here again, like with the church reform, there is a massive input from Europe to be accounted for, Britain and Europe. The driver of this or the result of this uh, is a great boom in the 12th and 13th century. This is a map of the population. Uh, it's nicely out of focus, but uh, 1200 come, uh, 1300 comes about there. There's 1100. Population goes up by about three times uh, across Western Europe. That has a massive effect, obviously, on the whole e underlying economics. Land becomes valuable because food is needed. Labor is plentiful, so wages are lower. Uh, as a result, you can see here some of the price rises, in particular that of corn, uh, up to about 1300, rising steadily more than three times over the period. Uh, here, over the, this is the Here's the 14th century decline. Uh, here, 14th and 15th century, you can see how uh, the uh, price index is high, the wage index is low um, during this period. So obviously an estate is going to have the opportunity and the possibility of producing a lot of grain and, if they could, and to selling it. But to sell it and to organize this, you need a system of merchants. And this uh, leads to a whole development of uh, towns, small towns across Western Europe from the 11th century onwards. They're different from the earlier emporia, the things that we associate with the Vikings in Ireland, like Waterford and Wexford or Dublin which were primarily for long distance trade, uh, connecting uh, the countries with each other and uh, dealing very largely with uh, high value, uh, low bulk goods. What this, the movement from the 11th century onwards is rather different. Instead of that, you get small communities uh, and many of them, whose job it is is to collect the produce from the immediate area around them, principally grain, ship it to where the market was in the rising larger towns uh, elsewhere. Uh, in Ireland, this would be down to probably to the south um, and east, or across to England. Uh, it, they also sheltered craftspeople who uh, were making things which the local towns, uh, rural communities wanted. Clothes, shoes, tools, low, not very high value, but a large volume when you see it all together. The third part of this is coinage. It's very important and if you find a very considerable growth in coin usage uh, from the 11th century onwards. And this is important because coins, if we think of the traditional uh, Irish uh, unit of value, the cow, uh, as opposed to coins, uh, you see the difference. If you're a, a craftsman, a mason, let us say, and you do some work, and you were pro the uh, patron proposed to pay you by giving you 10 cows. This is frankly useless. You've got to feed them, you aren't a farmer, you don't want cows. 
What are you going to do with the darn cows? They'll die on you quite soon with a bit of, you can eat them and there's not much else. Coins, you can hoard. You can save them, you can buy things with them. Uh, you can feed your family and friends. Uh, you can, above all, you're mobile. You can carry the coins with you. If you wanted to move, uh, you heard there was a job going, building Carrick Fergus and you were in Chester. In fact, a lot of good it would be to have to carry a whole lot of cows with you to set up business. Uh, a bag of coins is much more effective. So that you get these things all feeding in together, uh, you get the rise, the incoming we know of new craftsmen coming into uh, Ulster and into County Antrim. They have to be new. These were crafts, that the stone building, uh, for example, had been confined to round towers and small churches, massive projects like uh, either a big castle like Carrick Fergus or uh, uh, an abbey like Grey Abbey were way beyond the uh, resources or skills and organization of the 11th century uh, building industry in Ireland. At the, so it, there has to be an influx here of people, an influx of craftsmen, influx of merchants as well. People who know how the market works, who can deal with uh, the shipping and other stuff. And the crafts need not be all high end. Pottery. Again, we see the influx on the top left from the Lion Patrick Kiln. Those are pots made in the style of Northern England, probably Northwestern England. The potter has come from there. Carrick Fergus kiln, also very similar in styles, and again, probably coming from Northwest England. So these are, these are innovations, which in the in terms of what I was uh, doing before, are sudden changes brought about by people coming in. No question about it. But there is another side to it. The Merchants who come in will have to get to know the hinterland of the town, Carrick Fergus, Portrush, Coleraine, or Antrim, the, the principal ones in our area. They would have to get to know the people to buy the, the, and sell the goods into the local communities, almost certainly by a system of fairs or the locals, the country people coming into the town to buy. They would have to know them because they would be off, uh, the difficulty of buying uh, something like one of these jugs, which costs, if it costs less than a penny and the only coinage is a penny, how do you give change? Uh, you have to buy a lot on tick or with barter and so on. So you have to know the people. You will have to know the language, learn the language, integrate it. And we also see. Uh, in uh, this one, we see the uh, effect of uh, the incomers on the local pottery, uh, the so-called ulcer courseware, inverted rimware, uh, which takes over its styles with, from these sort of small cook cooking pots with the thing uh, with the inverted rims. That's the name. Um, but not the technology. They don't move over to kilns. Uh, they don't uh, make the pots on a wheel. So these are not incomers. This is an idea move, some ideas moving across uh, from one craft into uh, people practicing the same craft, but in a different way, Irish. So you see here both sides. Or, or two particular cases, incoming people and new ideas, and new ideas spreading through the local uh, industry and communities. The prosperity of Ulster uh, and the um, uh, background to the towns and the booming economy is, of course, the uh, uh, is is uh, agriculture. 
they were definitely were. Ulster was, uh, was prosperous at the time. Uh, it made anything up to, judging by some of the figures. Uh, you've got, for example, in 1225 to 26, the five bailiwicks of Ulster uh, produced in a year 936 pounds, four shillings and fourpence. Don't forget the fourpence. Um, Carrick, Fergus and Antrim bailiwicks, the two in, that we're concerned with, produced uh, 620 odd of this, i.e. two thirds. In uh, 1259 to 62, Twescard up in the Northwest uh, added some 152 pounds a year uh, to the thing. So an income of a thousand pounds in the 13th century would be a very satisfactory baronial income uh, in English terms. Uh, nothing like royal, but would be would have been a considerable uh, well worth it. Uh, the accounts uh, are not rounded up and down. Uh, you get things like uh, the 936, four shillings and fourpence is not the same. The next year goes up and down. So this is not, these are not formal uh, rough estimates of the, of the income. These are genuine uh, accounts of real income, uh, which presumably is coming in in coinage. So again, you see that this is being uh, the coinage the urban uh, mechanism to uh, realize the profits of the agriculture. And this involves obviously a lot more production, intensive production, as well as marketing uh, from the estates of the countryside. And then we know what they're producing, it's cereals. Uh, you get uh, in 1212 pipe roll, uh, Ulster is, is credited with producing more than a uh, more than a hundred tons of flour. Um, uh, we have licenses to export grain. The key item that we see in the accounts of uh, any uh, estate are mills. They produce anything up to three quarters or uh, a half or uh, of the total receipts of the manor. Uh, so you get clearly that goes back to production, goes back to your estates and leads us on to considering the business of, of how these estates were organized and rural settlement as a whole. Uh, and I want to talk about this in three sections, if you like. First of all, the uh, estate centres uh, uh, as points on the, the landscape. Uh, then to consider the buildings that are associated with the, the estates and then move on to the settlement and housing of the peasantry below. Uh, first of all, the estate centres. Luckily for us, the, it was the custom to provide some sort of structure in the landscape that would uh, mark out this as being the important place to be, the centre of the estate. If you want to do business, here is where you do it. And they did it in a number of ways. Uh, the most common, as we'll see, is the mod. Uh, we see here uh, a couple of mots here, and there uh, the uh, bugbear, if you like, of those who, like me, are so sad as having to spend time making lists of mots. And I can tell you, it's a boring enough old job. Um, they, uh, these are generally considered to be earlier from the 10th, 9th, 10th century, that sort of time, maybe even later. How do you tell the difference? Well, by and large, as you can see, here's things that are assigned. That you can see the raised rafts are both wider across the top 
and lower in height. Uh, and this by and large works. The uh, things with circles are those with, uh, sorry, with the flags, are those with a mop with baileys, which are certainly to be considered as mops. So it seems to work. Uh, and it allows us, therefore, to map. And one, these are also uh, one of the commonest uh, marker indicators of estate centers. They have the advantage, thing like this or this, the advantage, it doesn't occupy a great area, but it has got a big volume uh, to the area. To remove that by hand is quite a job and you don't gain a lot of valuable uh, land. As opposed to the traditional univalley wrath, where you knock the bank down into the ditch, the bank is only about this high, you can do it quite easily and gain a reasonable amount of money. So the motive for destroying these things is relatively weak, which means that we've probably got a fair, we can rely that we've got a good proportion of the original population of them now. And if we look at South Antrim, this has been done by Sandra Bill a long time ago, and just do polygons, the teeth and polygons around them, and around the raised rafts, which are earlier, uh, we see a difference. First of all, the fewer rate, the most obvious is the fewer raised rafts, so that the estates that they serve would seem to be bigger. They also have something of a feeling that they are more in the uplands than the mots. Mots concentrate very much in two areas here, uh, set more closely together. What it looks like is that the estates of this, uh, of the raised rats, are more uh, mixed agriculture. They send, it's, seem to be sited more or less on the boundary between the improved grassland and the uplands, so that you're getting both arable and pastoral into the estate, while the mots seem to be much more focused on the lower land, on the arable, uh, as you would expect for there, and smaller, more intense estates. And if we look again, this is exactly the pattern that we see in the, 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 the uh, parishes, small and fairly uh, high value uh, in these two areas of the mods. The implication of that to my mind is that we have got a couple of events that happened. One is this, the move from these estates to these ones. Uh, that agriculture, estate, uh, the estates get smaller, the agriculture gets more intense. Uh, when did it happen? Well, this is where you go back to the business of the, of the uh, parish, the formation of the parish and the, the uh, question of tithes and so on. The estates that this and this depend on are very similar, look very much the same and quite a lot of the mots here are related to parish churches there. They seem to go together. Uh, but the parish, as I've argued, is quite likely to be before 1170s more of the 1150s, in which case, logically, the estates that are represented here also go back to before. What the Mott is doing is simply marking the takeover by an English lord of an existing estate and running it presumably differently uh, to, make, uh, to take advantage of the increased uh, agricultural prices and marketing. There's a contrast between that and the northwest of the earldom up in Tweskard, where you see uh, on the map of the Mots, this part here is relatively, uh, has, well, has got none. Yet this is the area where we see the record uh, of the uh, 
estates, boroughs or manors, uh, and the parishes associated with them. Contrasts, the, this northwest contrasts with the south and east, where you have mots, but no very little in the way of recorded uh, English uh, and particularly Earl's uh, occupation. It's also the poorer land. So uh, you've got uh, a two or three contrasts going on. The contrast between uh, here and here overall, and then the contrast within Tuescard between to the northwest and the southeast in the pattern and distribution of estates. The next thing is how the, these estates are marked out. What is the indicator? Well, the mot, as I said, is one. And here you get probably the best preserved and most, uh, the largest and best preserved are the mots of County Antrim. Harryville, just, uh, just uh, up from Lidl in Palomina, uh, which is meant to control. Um, and this is at the heart of the Irish lands of the Hertra, and the Bespers, and along it, with it, uh, is how do we go back? Uh, as you can see, a number of other mots. This one would be, Harryville would probably be that one there. Um, so uh, there is no distinction between Irish and English in the construction of mots. Nor is there in the other form of uh, marker, which is the small polygonal stone enclosure. I've got three or four of them here. This is one of which is the extreme south of Tuescard. Whether it belongs in Tuescard or Ehertra is unclear. It's if we take the line of, uh, of the uh, water river, it lies within Tuescard and the Earldom. What you've got is a little uh, enclosure, of in, uh, an area of about, uh, as you can see, about 25, 30 meters, enclosed by a polygonal stone wall. You can see it there preserved. Here it is, it's a rock outcrop overlooking thing, and here you see the, the construction. Uh, the, there are other two other examples, Court McMartin, Connor. Uh, one is belong, Court McMartin must belong to a visit. Uh, it's just outside uh, a cushion door. While Connor uh, is obviously at the uh, near the cathedral of Connor, could be the uh, residence of the bishop, but it's a couple of hundred yards from the cathedral. And there is also in 1260 a document signed by M. O. Flynn, King of E. Hertra, uh, which is dated and signed at Connor. So I suspect that this is uh, the uh, residence of the O. Flynn King. Uh, again, we have got possibly uh, English, uh, enclosure like this. Uh, we've got visits, the, uh, the Anglo-Scots and an Irish Lord all constructing the same idea. Uh, a further version of this or a variant on this lies in the west of Twesc east of Tuescard in the area around Ballycastle, uh, where you get Monuments like Dromadoon here, excavated by uh, Cormac McSparren and, and Brian Williams, um, having been discovered by Barry Hartwell, um, up here. It's sort of mot. It was built on an earlier structure, uh, a raised raft type thing, and uh, was heightened a little, but it's certainly in a very prominent position as the entrance at the entrance to the main Carry Glen, uh, up, going up the hill, over the hills towards Christian Dunn. Uh, it's not really a moth, but it's obviously related to it. 
So tour south of Valley Castle is this one grew more. You get uh, what appears to be a remodeling, certainly a remodeling of a natural mind, then a remodeling, perhaps of a remodeling. And here at Knockerhollet, a classic raised wrath with a little tiny mot on the top. Uh, it's very sweet. Uh, and if it you know, eats its sweeter pix, it will grow up and be a big one and a proper mot. Uh, these are in this curious area between where the, of Tweskart, where as I say, the uh, documentary evidence of English occupation is, lit, uh, is uh, missing. Uh, it may be indeed, uh, particularly Dramadoon might just possibly be in Bissett Lands. Dramadoon certainly, I think, from the presence of the shrine of the um, bell, uh, bell reliquary that was discovered there, has got to be thought of as the uh, headquarters of an Irish lord, presumably an Irish lord, a tenant of the earldom. Uh, again, you see this fusion at this level of society. Uh, uh, between the mot, the raised wrath, the uh, stone enclosure altogether. The actual houses that we get, uh, I have to leave County Antrim to go to Cloch for the classic uh, Lord's uh, residence, which is a large hall, stone hall with a little stone chamber tower beside it. Uh, perfectly uh, normal in English terms, the only thing that's odd about it is that this stone tower here is on top of the mot when you would expect it to be down below. Uh, we see this in uh, Bissett Land near Cushion Dunwith Castle Cara, again a small uh, chamber tower uh, with a first floor doorway there, you can see the holes for the platform, for the stairs outside, and we must imagine a wooden hall uh, outside it on that side. Uh, again, a perfectly English sort of uh, dwelling place. But then you get the oddity, again we go to County Down, of Ballinari, uh, a raised wrath, raised up a bit more, again, a bit like uh, uh, um, Rathmullen, uh, not which is not far away, but the top. Uh, the, this was undoubtedly in the 13th century. The 13th century glazed pottery. You get Ulster courseware uh, and decorated souterrain ware, classic of the 13th century, late 12th, early 13th century. But here, what he labels as a house, it's only about five meters square at most. <coughs> less inside. It may be a tower, but if it is a house, it looks very like the sort of square house that you see uh, in uh, attached uh, or with souterrains attached to them sitting outside uh, as we were like places like Ballyweed we would see. I.e. here is an in 13th century uh, residence or central place which is partaking of quite a mixed cultural assemblage, part English, part Irish. We move on to the settlements of the peasantry. Uh, we see a situation in which uh, you get, uh, such as we can see, uh, here is a classic case of a very straggly uh, organization. The castle is up here, the church down here, excavation was up there. Uh, a dispersed settlement. And indeed, many of the, uh, there is good evidence that the estates that we see were even more dispersed than that. A manor in Ulster could include pockets of land quite some way away from the center. Uh, the classic would be the manor of Doch where uh, attached to it was a sub uh, a unit at Bally Easton, which is about five miles away from Doak. And it too had a court 
and the parish church, that the settlement was very dispersed in the documentation. And so we see it, I think, in the archaeology. Uh, what you see is a very casual, what is apparently a house there with central aisle uh, running down it, a shallow, one of these shallow ditches, which you probably to take uh, either to be take the eave strip as it may be, but there are uh, stake holes along it. They are double line of stake holes. So I think this ditch is not that, but it is uh, for a wicker work uh, house. And that would explain the rounded nature of it, that this is a rectangular house with rounded ends. Uh, the position of it uh, is difficult to know how the church, the castle, and the settlement, the peasant settlement relate, but this area here in the geo geophysical survey showed sort of scattered uh, lines of what were possibly paths or little. And it, when excavated, these are very, sh there are spreads of stone, shallow ditches uh, being recut and cut across each other. Sure, the implication is that any of the structures are really quite short lived. And indeed, the settlement itself may be relatively short lived. We get two others which uh, provide uh, an interest, uh, three others rather, which provide an interesting twist on this. Killy Glen uh, was uh, first identified and then excavated uh, with the assumption that this was a church in a churchyard, a mot there, hacked about, and then clearly uh, we would assume that this was the area of a village settlement. We excavated in that area, uh, carried out ge uh, geophysical survey in that area, and excavated all the anomalies, nothing, no pottery, no evidence that the uh, anomalies were anything other than natural. Uh, so there we were stuck until the UAS and David Craig came along and uh, did uh, a, a survey that you can see here. Uh, here is the churchyard here and the enclosure, which we knew about, which would appear to have it's got an inner one here with possibly the house there. This, I suspect, is the priest's dwelling attached to the, uh, or built along with the churchyard wall. The interesting thing is here it is here, cutting across one of a number of what appear to be house platforms there. So that this Killy Glen offers us a case not of the Lord constructing a mot or the, uh, and uh, a parish church and then the settlement following, but the settlement being there first, followed by the construction or reconstruction of the churchyard and church and churchyard here, and the mot is semi-detached the whole operation and does not it cannot be seen as the uh, driver of this settlement. Again, it looks as though the mot is coming in after the settlement is in existence. Here again, another David Craig site, who has revolutionized a lot of this, um, at Craig Rogan, our fort in Craig Rogan. You've got a church site up here, a mot there, but then look at these enclosures here. Uh, at least one looks, uh, there's four of them, particularly noted on um, notebook in the 19th century. But, and those look as though you've got church up here, church up there, a dependent settlement there, and into it is inserted the mot. 
can see it now clearly perhaps there, uh, being pushed in. Again, the Mott is coming after the settlement, not before, uh, as it should. And then thirdly, uh, just not far away from uh, Rough Fort, uh, down the six mile, uh, down the Belly Martin River, uh, you've got the site at Belly Martin itself. Uh, it consists of a very ploughed out mott, uh, which is mostly, if it wasn't for the account in the uh, Ordnance Survey memoirs, uh, we wouldn't really, I think, recognise it as a mott. It is set up against a little where, uh, a point where the, the uh, river runs through a rocky outcrop. The, uh, this is the view from it. From there, the river runs down, and at this point, the, uh, there is a difference between the, the rocky ravine there and the. the Banks get steeper in here, and you've got a bit where the banks are low, a crossing point that you can. And then over the other side, we have a church site here, and you can't really see them, but uh, on the ground, you can make out the remains of house platforms. Here you see the, a sketch plan of it, line of that thing going over to the ford, the mot up here, church. Now again, as with uh, Killy Glen, you've got a church and house platforms with a mot detached. The mot is sited on a place where it will be at its most prominent, uh, not where it is beside the uh, settlement, separated from it by the, the river. If the mot had generated the church and house, I would have expected it to be in the level ground here, uh, tying them all in together. It looks again like Killy Glen, the mot is coming afterwards. Then we have got a site here at the Glen McKeeran, excavated by Brian Williams in the 70s, which he identified as a bully settlement. Uh, it's not. It's only at about 550 feet. It's at the point where the glen, uh, it, it, it's set here, there's the little the Glen McGeeran River, and here the Carry River. Drummadoon is there. Uh, this is here, that's a mile. Uh, it's at the point, the upper point of the improved uh, uh, land uh, improved grazing and crop growing uh, part. Not a place for bullying. What you've got is uh, a little settlement of three houses, possibly more before the gra gravel quarry removed some, possibly, we don't know. Uh, here, a sod built house uh, of uh, distinctly Ulster, uh, Irish uh, connections. Um, this is not, I think in any case, uh, this is, has got no uh, English uh, connotations at all. This is a settlement of Irish people uh, attached possibly to the Lordship. They might be connected to the Lordship there. There's a, on the other hand, there's a, a, a graveyard just here. There might be another Lordship for this clan, a small community. Uh, of Irish uh, people living in a house built undoubtedly with an Irish tradition. If we look at the bank at the Port Muck house, uh, what it reminds me of is uh, this house here, this what Chris Lynn, when he excavated Ballywee down in uh, not far from um, Doha, in that part of the Six Mile Water Valley. Um, here, it's got a stone, uh, a stone lined wall, a central uh, path here. We see it here in, in more detail, uh, very much like the wicker round there and the central uh, aisle of the Port Muck House. 
This, of course, also looks back, I think, uh, or looks very much towards the standard Dublin house, a wicker, rectangular wicker house with a central aisle. Right, if we summarize now uh, where we've got to and try and tie this a bit together, if I can find my notes. Uh, that's interesting. I'm going to do a, no, no, here we are. This is it. Uh, yes, I thought for a moment I was going to do a Boris Johnson, I have to talk about Pe Peppa Pig or something, uh, but no. Um, if we can summarize, first of all, before we discuss where it takes us, briefly, we've got a clear-cut economic change going on. The introduction of coinage, market, economy, it may or may not penetrate very deeply into the lives of a lot of the uh, peasantry, but it certainly would have uh, penetrated quite clearly into the lives of the people, the free tenants and farmers and uh, lesser lords who were running these smaller estates. The estates themselves, uh, with their uh, decentralized uh, structure, uh, provide are uh, built around quite small uh, settlements, uh, probably several to the estate, settlements involved with half a dozen houses, that sort of thing. Uh, the peasant houses, uh, or the peasant house, the only one we've got, Port Muck, uh, difficult to say whether it belongs with an Irish tradition of Dublin or with an English tradition, the rectangular or rectangular house, uh, but or either. The situation, the uh, overall position of uh, County Antrim is not a homogenous society, different lordships, different patterns of settlement, different patterns of housing and buildings. There's no feeling here of a colonizing agenda of having a single operation that runs it. And this runs counter, I think, to two uh, common trends, tr common, sorry, not common trends, common um, uh, features that you will read in parts of the narrative that you will read about 13th century, uh, 12th and 13th century Ireland. The first of these is that the nucleated village uh, is a marker as an indicator, and this is a, is a measure of how intense the English settlement was. That where the English were, uh, that many English peasantry came over, there you will have nucleated villages. More importantly, where you don't have nucleated villages, their settlement was less intense. Uh, you can see it here, uh, suggests largely little colonization. Uh, here you get very clearly the linkage, arrival of the Anglo-Normans, villages were formed. This is part of the consolidation of settlement with open field thing. And here, uh, and I bring this up because although uh, this is still, this view is still alive and well, being published 2020, just last year. Um, I think it's easy to demolish this from both ends, either end. Uh, on the first, on the English side, actually, when you look, this idea goes back to Glasscock in the 1960s, and he was drawing on the work of Beresford in the 1950s and 60s, the whole idea of deserted medieval villages were the big thing in medieval studies at the time. But in fact, the area of open field agriculture is, does not cover England. Crucially, East Anglia, most of the southeast of England, uh, we don't find them. They're a particular phenomenon in a particular area. There is no reason to believe that, all, that this is the classic English settlement. 
If we look in Scotland as well, there we see another thing, the normal thing there is the firm two. Uh, you see here one with a uh, half, something like six or seven houses there, the rigs or the infield with an outfield settlement beyond. In Ireland, uh, we can see these dispersed settlements, uh, not just in the margins, as O'Connor would have said. For example, in, uh, here, reconstruction of the layout. This is in Colp, in County Meath, classic thing, in which you've got a core, the memorial centre with the church, the, the, manor, the memorial buildings, but a whole series of free tenants and uh, farmers in uh, named places, which can be identified as townlands nowadays, uh, away from the center. Here again, in Tipperary, Manorial Center, and again, uh, evidences of my, uh, farmers and others scattered around. The uh, road scheme has discovered a whole lot of, well, not a whole lot, quite a number of medieval, uh, later medieval settlements. Uh, they've yet to find a village. This would be the sort of thing that they've turned up. A, a scattering of one or two, through, in this case, two or three houses along a roadway. They've produced single farmsteads, two or three of them. Uh, nothing like the classic village. Uh, that we've seen. So this idea that the village is normal, I think should go, certainly in uh, Antrim, and probably in Ulster, what is much more uh, likely to be the case is a small thing like uh, of half a dozen houses, five up to that, poorly, uh, poorly built and probably not very long lasting, either as individual buildings or indeed as settlements that they would shift around. Again, suiting the idea of infield, outfield agriculture, much more than the idea of open field. Uh -huh. uh, but that's not the end. Uh, the second view that takes, I think, uh, which is more serious, it is uh, the one thing that is a constant theme of all medieval studies uh, of the period after 12th, of 12th century and afterwards. The idea that 12th, 13th century Ireland was uh, divided into two, nat two nations. Uh, the two nations idea. It runs right through it that there are the English and the Irish. The two nations are separate and opposed to each other is usually the tacit understanding. Clearly, this derives from 19th and 20th century nationalistic view of how Ireland was uh, run in the past. Uh, based on that, the, this is uh, both explained and contributes is the idea that the new system was brought in as part of a package with the Anglo-Norman conquest, which is seen as a military thing. Uh, the English come over, conquer, bring in a colony and so on. This is the model which results in the idea that then there would be resulting from this two nations that operate. Uh, if we look at this and the present analysis, uh, you can see that the, if you like, four parts of this. Uh, you've got the conquest, you've got the uh, a reform of the church, and you've got the uh, new uh, economy and uh, township, and then a new system of agriculture, all brought in as part of a single agenda. Interestingly, certainly the first two have been very steadily eroded, if not abolished. No longer can we see it as a single conquest in the way that Orpen looked on it. We see a series of individual seizures of individual lordships, sometimes by invitation, sometimes even by marriage, uh, 
resulting in marriage, a lot of intercourse between the even the top lords and the uh, local Irish kings. Uh, marriage alliances taking place. But it's not seen, certainly no longer is it seen as a directed conquest, an agenda by Henry II. It's seen as a series of individual uh, events. The uh, church reform, Mary Therese Flanagan's new book on it, emphasizes how much the new diocese and the new orders uh, were grafted on to a church without so much, uh, not particularly with friction, that they were going with the gray, that the air, that reform was resisted early, but the resistance quickly fell away. And once it did, it left no particular uh, uh, problems behind. That the reform uh, won the argument as well as winning the actual events. The economy, how much we should see this as a part that the Lords were involved with, or how much was this going to happen anyway? That this was the story across Europe of the steady uh, uh, um, expansion of a market economy and uh, market towns. Uh, would this have happened anyway? I think what we certainly can say it might, but that it is likely that the English lords acted as a catalyst, that an events, if a process was perhaps uh, in train, but they moved it up very much more quickly than it would have otherwise. And again, the estates, they, were they new or were they simply again taking over, putting a mot on top of an existing center? Uh, and taking over a system which at least in part had been started or had be, uh, been connected with the formation of parishes, the formation of uh, estates that goes along with that. That again, they would have been working with the grain, what we might be literally, uh, cereal grain as well, that they would be intensified a process which had begun already, rather than introducing something from new. Uh, basically, I don't think there was a single agenda operating here at all in any of these four ways. Uh, there was no one size fits all colonization process. What we've got is a set of different regional and lordly schemes, which are designed to make the most out of the new lands that they have seized and to allow the lords uh, who have gained them to live in the way uh, that they had every intention of becoming accustomed to. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed for an absolutely fascinating talk. I think, uh, you know, we can always expect you will challenge traditional thinking on things and uh, make us really so sort of, um, just put, it, put our mind to what uh, we have uh, traditionally thought about medieval life and uh, how things were before the Anglo Norms came in. So I thank you very much indeed for a really very thought-provoking and interesting talk. And, um, I'm sure there's probably a few questions. Um, do we have any online, Courtney? I'm yeah. checking now. What about in the room? Is anybody? Thomas. Thomas, I don't know if it's a question, it'll be more of a statement if you don't mind. Um, you can tell me almost everything I know, but I'm afraid <laughs> there's aspects of what you said I totally disagree with. But I have brought my boxing gloves with me, so very right. brief, but, um, the first one I would take exception to is, um, first of all, that time lag between uh, 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 seas and parish, especially of parish. I think they have to be totally integrated, kind of one without the other. The other is the idea that uh, the parish is, although you sort of taunted out about it at the end, that the parishes were uh, a new creation. I think the strengths of the proto-parish, of the plebeian, yeah. and the mother church, very highly developed. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I agree entirely that they were, well, this is what I was meaning by that they were working with the girl. Well, yes, they actually said that, that yeah. was great, yes. uh, good man. Uh, <laughs> I would totally disagree with you, maybe you don't agree with yourself when you said you thought the uh, formation of powers is very much tied up uh, the same sort of land revolution, you could almost call it, delineation of town lands. I think town lands are much, much earlier. They could be, they could be. But the Greek state, the 7th, 6th century. They could, they yeah. could certainly. Uh, Though it is interesting that the others would disagree and put them yeah, well, to the 12th century, yeah, state, that's one way of 11th century. Uh, you I are think, not necessarily. Yeah. Last word is, uh, I think the delineation of parish is that uh, there are subtle differences between each diocese. And each diocese sure. Roots, you know, that was exactly what I was. That's, I think it was very far advanced in, in dying, I, I call her before. Yeah, well, it, it was, but not in the north. Uh, I think the, I think Twescard was running on a different yeah, operation. Yeah, but you're after some bots up there. You don't see that just as chronological. Mm. It's not. It's not to do with anything. Yeah, itself. what you've got, this is what I mean, you've got a series of individual events taking place at individual places, and it's oh. not an agenda. Well, there is a, a long-term yeah. agenda, but it, it there, nobody is coming in, whoosh, bang, and no, setting it absolutely. all up, yep. is the point. Yeah. So that it's strong in the south of Connor, where the, that's, there. Where, where, that's where Maliki was operating around, and the north of Connor was in more confusion, partly because of King John and the, and the de Galloways. Is that the smaller parish units? Which? In the south. I mean, mm. Yeah. I think they are minor in some divisions of the larger It Irish could be, certainly could be, but it's unlikely that the parishes get subdivided. Oh, no, I would disagree with you there, especially in Argonne, Norman here, yes, there were a lot of... You can, not, I mean, not, you can, not, it's very difficult to, di to well, divide parishes. Some of the parishes, like, not you can. very much, I think, tied in. Where is this? Uh, Which one? It's Grace Beach, but uh, 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 probably a classic one, but even Kirk and uh, Rolla. You see, that's what we disagree about, and I did find a student that disagree with you on that, that uh, those mots uh, were built by a church, and I think they're very, uh, they're all along the major railways, and for a very short period, they've only about you know, 20 years or so or less, the Anglo Normans did secure all the railways. You know, so no evidence for it at all. Like Harry, but like so it's quite, it, it seems quite clear that de Courcy never went north of a line between Antrim and Larne. I disagree. So well, what evidence have you for it? Uh, it's absence of evidence, but uh, <laughs> we've got the archaeology. No, no, Mott, Mott's are not difficult. The idea no. that you can not get a group of Irishmen to pile a load of earth, one of the <laughs> loads of earth, you, it would be very easy yeah, to construct. Distribution. Uh, the Mott's very, very uh, strongly uh, allied to crossing points and the road. Only, the only, only they are own, they are only, they are only closely associated with the routeways in the north of Antrim, not in the south. And the main key church are there. That yeah. road is straight. Yeah, from, sure. From but why should why just because it's a, on a roadway? Why shouldn't it be Irish doing it? Uh, it's in an Irish lordship. Irish it's in an Irish lordship. Because it, uh, there's no evidence that the English ever had land up there. They didn't have land, but secured all the railways. And then how do you secure? How do you secure? How do you secure? How do you secure a routeway if you don't have the land? Yeah, well, by a garrison. And they're, no, they, they, they can't. Are garrison you can't. They don't pay for this. Medieval lordship could not afford or pay garrisons. That's why they disappeared. That's why they only were garrisons maybe for maybe of 10 I, years. You're making a story which is based on the idea that a mot must be English. No. Well, what other evidence have you found? No, well, no, you maybe, maybe, I, maybe I am, but I'm making a story or an interpretation based on the landscape and based on the distribution. Yeah, but you can put that just as easily to make it an Irish one. Well, it's much more logical than your business. <laughs> no, why is it more logical? It's only logical because if you take as an assumption that a mot is English. 
Well, yes. I think maybe um, we should. Uh, yes, yes. I'm 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 an interesting. <laughs> Interest of letting other people have a word in to move on to the time being. Thank you. Anybody else in the room like to make a comment or ask a question? Yes, please. The map that showed green, blue, and pink of the parishes. Yeah, sounds good. How come there were blue bits further away down and there were pink bits further away up? They weren't actually close together. You'd think, well, if you're creating your parish, it would be closer to you. And also the fact that Carrick Fergus was actually grey. Oh, ah, right, right, right. Sorry. That, those, that map, yes, here we are. This one, here. This is the ownership of rectories. Is the pink. These are the rectories owned by Kells. These blue are the ones owned by Muckamore. Gray, Carrick Fergus, uh, I've forgotten who, I can't remember who had it, the rectory. Over, the, the, the blue yeah. seemed very spread out. Yes, yes. I think that, that this comes from, the, the somebody has to grant, of course, somebody has to grant, first of all, the parish has got to be constructed. Somebody then has to be the person who collects the tithes. And then that person would have to grant the right, the rectory, to Muckamore or Kells or whoever it is. And I think this does not happen. Again, it's an example. It happens haphazard. Some do, some don't. Uh, the point that I would get from this is that these two were very much seem to be the first in on the act. They get the, the lion's share of the rectories that are going. No other place has got more than a couple. That was the point that I was making. And that, you know, how do you get to be the first in? You get there before 1170 or whatever. 1150s. Um, it, Yes, I mean, it is interesting. Maybe what you've got is that Kells, there's Connor, and Kells itself is there, that they are more active, that they you know, really make a, a policy of picking them up in the area that they're operating, while Muckamore is a little more um, less well organized. But going around the people to get, somebody's got to grant them, they can't seize them. Somebody's got to give them to them, to the, 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 the monastic house, the priory. And I think this is just haphazard. What is interesting about this is that Woodburn, which is the one beside Carrick Fergus, probably therefore most connected with the earth. In fact, it's got an even more scattered lot. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a feeling that it's picking up the ones that are left. <laughs> After Macamore and um, Kelsey. So, well, just just following on that on that question there, in terms of the other religious orders that are involved now, I'd, I'd be far more familiar with parts of County Down rather mm -hmm. than that piece. And uh, the, the, the bits in between are there other religious orders that are being granted lands and later on in the Benedictines being granted offices on them, or the uh, not many. Are? If you, the, the, there are not many um, rectories granted out. So certainly not to Benedict. I don't know how much I'd have to go back to see whether the, the one that would be doing it would be Don Patrick, would be the one you'd expect to be mopping up. I just don't know. I've done this here. Yeah. I didn't do Don. We're just in parts of Yeah. Don Patrick's the principal player, and then there's a dispute about um, where St Andrews and the Ards fits into this. Because that retains an awful lot of the, the, the offices and, and directories and go with those. Uh, and even within those, uh, um, the relationship between those and the monastic estates prior to yeah. the, 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 the 12th century or mm -hmm. and then those monastic estates from the new orders is quite an interesting yeah. cor correlation in them, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but then every so often it just gets thrown sideways with, with a bit of land on it. The odd, one of the odd ones is there's no parish for Grey Abbey. No, not. not, not, not 
problem. I think the yeah. I think the Cistercians didn't like having parishes. Well, I, th I think in that area, there's something else that was also layered over with uh, the 17th century redistribution of lands. It's, it's yes, I suppose is worse with parish boundaries. Can uh, get moved. Uh, yes. Well, there's some, uh, certainly after the. Um, Plantation, not that that applies to Antrim. There's a lot of amalgamation of parishes, particularly in Down and Antrim, because there, there are too many small ones. There's something like 50 or 60 parishes in each of the two dioceses, while the norm is to have about 20 to 30. Did you reconstruct all the amalgamations? You, know? mm -hmm. you can reconstruct all the amalgamations except for maybe uh, Island McGee, you know? In the 17th century. Yeah, you, you can uh, yeah, eradicate but, that from interpretation by reconstructing yeah. the medieval parishes from the civil parishes, you know, allowing for all the. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there is a question from Carol Smith online just asking for reading suggestions on this topic. If you have any soft order. Thank you, Norman Ulster. No. Mentions there is nothing in that by this at all because it was written in 1970. No, 1980. Um, about what in particular? Um, just expanding on the topic, that's all Carol said. Um, oh God. Let me, um, I'll ask if. The, I suppose the starting point would be O'Connor's, uh, Kieran O'Connor's, what is it, rural settlement in Ireland or something. Um, but it's, uh, Kieran is totally convinced on this nucleated villages thing. Um, but it, it's a starting point. Some of this stuff is in that, in the publication on Killy Glen in Uja about three years ago. Uh, there's an enormous amount of sort of all sorts of stuff. Mary Therese Flanagan has produced a very good book on the uh, reform of the church about two or three years ago, four years ago. Yeah, it's very documentary based. Oh, entirely documentary based. Well, entirely, well, it's entirely well, about the upper end of the well, no, there is there is about five pages about parishes um, in the whole book because she is documentarily led and documents are done by the top end. So you won't get the thing. Uh, you won't get the, the pastoral side because that didn't leave documentation. So she doesn't do it. Um, there was a book on the Augustinian canons by Brown and Old Clabby a few years ago. Again, a lot of, uh, with, it's brought out the Augustinian Council has been, to, which corrects an awful lot of emphasis has been put on the Cistercians and much less on the Augustinian Canons. And that does a lot to, to rectify that bias because the Augustinian Canons are in there earlier and in greater numbers than the Cistercians. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. the only question so okay, far. Anybody else? Final questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, certainly, Tom, we've had a most interesting talk and a lot to think about. So, thanks very much indeed. So, I'll have us all just a small token of thanks for you. Thank, thank you very much, much indeed. indeed. Thank you. Before we go, can I just uh, remind you that uh, our next lecture um, is still on, um, on the 30th of October, so we hope to see as many of you as possible there. Yeah. Um, join us again for a cover. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.